and ladies and gentlemen, I have a problem. Can you hear me, Mr. Bell? Yes. If you can't, will you please say so? Um, I just come back uh, from uh, the, uh, the United States of America, where I had to do a great deal of talking, and my voice, uh, which is all right on the parade ground, doesn't carry very well. And if it doesn't, please tell me so, because I would hate us not to hear um, what we have to say to one another today. Uh, I'm very grateful to Werner's von der Heidt uh, for asking us, in a way, to begin uh, by remembering Irene Jump now, because I got back from the United States just in time to be with her before she died. And in fact, I came back to me last night from her funeral. Um, and uh, what she represents, in a way, and what she tried to do, will be moving in the background of what I have to talk to you about today. And I just remind myself of the last words she said before she died, uh, which I found very moving, and it's a great point of departure for us all. She said, all completed here, going on. So let us go on. I have undertaken to talk to you about a subject rather terrified me because there's so much to be said about it, and I can only say a fraction of what I would like to say to you today. And I've called it very loosely our time and the shadow of our time. And it's a, I won't, don't want to talk to you about this as an idea, but more <coughs> as a kind of experience. It is something which cannot be presented as an idea, because it's something uh, which in itself uh, is, is transcendental. I will come, come to that aspect of it at the moment, but it's something which seems to me to have been with me all my life. I've been involved in this problem one way or another ever since I can remember. And the first time I ever talked about it, I talked about it in Zurich at a specific request of Dr. Jung, because I had just come back from a very, very long um, uh, expedition and a sojourn among what I think are the oldest uh, uh, forms of human life in existence to this day. I've been living with the Stone Age people who had never been directly in contact with our civilization and whose mind really goes as close back to the beginning of spirit, really, where our own recorded history, where myth, where legend, where our intuition really comes to the edge of history, to the edge of the last of rights. They seem to me, as it were, to be in touch with something beyond. That they are, in a sense, what we can only dream today. And therefore, I took what they had to say to me very seriously. And I tell Dr. Jung how these people, confronted with the spectre, indeed, uh, with the imminent threat of the destruction of themselves and their own stone age, a stone age spirit. Whether I would call the shadow loomed gigantic over them and looked like overwhelming them. How did they react? How did they react to this threat? And it is summed up by a very great story they tell, which I will not go into detail now, 
But it's the last great story that they ever told. And it's probably the last great story that they ever will tell. Because I think, in a sense, the life of our time, which cast so great a shadow, will not enable it for that kind of spirit in that shape and in that form to survive. And in this, threatened with the destruction, what do they do? They tell the story about how their own God, who has just been beaten up by the forces that are about to overwhelm him, assembles around him all the various aspects of his spirit. He endures the feminine, the Ariadne aspect of man, which has always led him down into the deeps of his labyrinth and himself, to where he fights the beast in himself and comes up victorious again. He assembles the Ariadne spirit, he assembles his conscious spirit, which is represented as the sun, who is a rainbow element, who you knows the rainbow always throughout history, throughout the history of man, has represented the conscious discriminating element in man. It was so for Goethe, it's so in our own Bible, where after the flood, which is an image of how man can be overwhelmed by his own unconscious and ignored forces. It's placed in the sky as an ark, as a promise <coughs> from God to man that there is an element in the human spirit which can prevent this kind of invasion from occurring again. He assembles this element, he assembles all the various aspects of himself around him, and then he says, to his soul, his daughter. He says, I want you to go and fetch something which he calls the old devourer. Now, this is very moving because here we come to a strange parallel with the Greeks, where their own image of the feminine was born out of an old devouring element to see were born out of this foam and this spray of a wine red sea of morning. And he says to her, I want you to go and fetch your father, the old devourer, to come and dine with me. In other words, there's got to be a reckoning between me and what is all devoured in life. You must fetch it. And she's horrified. And she warns him and she says, You know what that man wants that is. If he comes, he will destroy you and the whole, all of us will go if he comes. He'll eat up everything. He says, nonetheless, I want you to fetch that man. And very sadly, she goes. But before she goes, wise in the way of the soul, she makes a small provision, which she hides, because she knows that when the reckoning is over, Something of what has been true in the past <coughs> will be needed for the life that is to come. And then she fetched, tells her father that God wants you to come and talk with him. And then she hurries back. And she says to this tiny little insect God in this great desert, she says to him, when you see a flicker of fire against the horizon, and you see a great shadow rise in the sky, you will know that the old one is coming. And then there's an awful moment of stillness, there's not a breath of wind, the sun beats down, and they sit there wondering what's going to happen. And suddenly there's a flicker of fire on the horizon, and the sky goes dark. And there we have a very moving account of how the God shrinks back from what he has willed himself. And he says, why is it that it grows so dark? What is it that makes it so dark? As if he didn't know. He wants this cup, as it were, to pass him by. 
And uh, this to me, I, when I want to tell at this point, I want to tell this story to T.S. Eliot. And um, he said to me, for the first time, you have made sense to me of symbolism that came to me in a poem. I knew that it meant I obeyed the symbolism without knowing what it means. And of course, it comes from that very prophetic poem that T.S. Eliot wrote after the wasteland. And this God, too, is sitting in a wasteland. A poem called The Hollow Men, when he writes, for instance, between the idea and the reality, between the motion and the act, falls the shadow. And he goes on every now and then, falls the shadow. And it is his own intimation, poetic intimation, of the shadow falling on us. And this God goes through this agonizing moment. And of course, this, the, the old devourer comes, the God is, the God himself, and all these aspects, including his wife, they're all consumed by the old devourer. Of course, except the old devourer does not consume his soul, his daughter, this eternal feminine element which plates the little nourishment buried in the sand of five feminine. And the feminine element with the help of the sun, two suns, one who represents the instinct, one who represents the conscious, they cut open the old devourer and they free the God. And all that means is confusion. And they come out in greater aspects of themselves. They have been renewed. And the God is able to lead them, as the story says, to a new country, to a new place far away, where they could live in content. In other words, could lead them into a new state of being. So ultimately, I'm telling you this right at the beginning, <coughs> Because faced with this fall of the shadow, faced with the shadow, we can only we can only deal with it adequately if we renew our relationship with the God. If the God Himself is renewed, and this story so moved after you, who was on the point of sitting down with Job on his ash heap. You never went into the detail of this. It always rather surprised me because he was so in the midst of it that he didn't go into the detail of why Job sat on an ash heap. Because Job was like this insect god in a way. Job sat on an ash heap because the whole culture the whole progression of spirits with which he was confronted was a burnt out fire. It had come to an end. He lost all his worldly goods. He lost his collective self. And he was just a reckoning between him and his own sense of God and the shadow of God which fell over him. And these ash heaps represented a burnt out phase in the history of the culture of his time. And that is when the shadow falls. And this is where we are today. And when I told him the story, he said to me, you must come and talk to us. And the result of it was that I did talk to him about it this very, and I wrote a book about it, out of it, which I called The Dark Eye in Africa. But if I were to write the book today, I would call it the dark eye in the world because the shadow, the eye of man all over the world has darkened so much in these 22 years since this talk and this occurred. I couldn't have believed myself that the eye of man could have darkened as it has darkened. Now, I chose this title, The Dark Eye in Africa, because it is used in Southeast Asia, where I spent 
a great deal of my time enduring, as it were, a shadow of our time. I chose this particular title, The Dark Eye, because it's used by the people of Java to describe a very significant collective psychological phenomenon. Both in Java and in Malay, Malaya, the Javanese and the Malay are very akin as people. They had a common ancestor. And even the word Malay gives you a clue to what the sort of, to, to do what kind of people they are. Because uh, Malay comes from the word Maru, which means gentle. They are the gentle people. And I myself have never seen people who in their contact with one another are both gentle, but also so correctly, so politely, so circumspect in their social behavior. They always seem to do all the right things. They observe all the laws and all the rules of their society with great fastidiousness. And yet, among these people who are so good, who do their duty by life so well, that something very extraordinary happens and happens on an unbelievably wide scale, you will suddenly find that a man who in this regard has been a model for his community will suddenly, at the age of about 40, will suddenly one day, for no external reason, for no apparent reason of the mind or of circumstances, will suddenly pull out his kris, his dagger, and he will run around and he'll kill every man, woman, child that he can find in this neighborhood. The Malay calls Malay call this the process of running amok. And if you were in the Malay village, as I once was, and the cry went up amok, it's one of the most terrifying cries you can hear. And what is this phenomenon that makes a man who's been so good suddenly run the mock. In Java, they don't call it the mock, but they say with infinite compassion, the, uh, they call this phenomenon, Mata Plak. They say the eye has done, and that is why the man behaves like that. So here is an indication, here is an indication already, that in a sense, human beings if they are purely connected, if they live purely a connected life, how no matter the, how, how virtuously they do it, how well they do it, there is something else in them which the collective life has rejected and which has grown unknown in their own spirit, has grown great and dark and angry. And because it has not had a legitimate outlet into their lives. It comes out illegitimately because we will not let it in by the front door of our consciousness and our spirit. It comes in like a murderer and a violent burglar through a back door and smashes everything in sight. And this phenomenon seems to me at the time I thought very much worth in my own continent of Africa. But this phenomenon, you only have to read your papers to see how already, on an individual basis, this phenomenon is with us now. I did, uh, the increase of individual violence, the increase of people who for apparently no reason start smashing the furniture start smashing the house, start killing one another, start destroying. It's rapidly on the increase. Oh, if you watched your television last night, but the bar the mine not yet, this is a phenomenon of an eye darkening in our midst, and people beginning to run amok. And this is letting out of account the electric scale on which the eye has darkened in Western civilization. If we look 
at the progression of European civilization since the Renaissance. We see human beings on an increasing scale killing and murdering one another. Europe has been one of the most blood sodden battlegrounds in the history of man. The amount of killing, the amount of darkening of the eye on a collective basis is simply terrifying. We, 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 we see it over and over again, and I, we had the most cataclysmic part of this in the war which took place in 1939 to 1945. A war which for the, for, for the horror, we have no other war and no other period in history of which we know in which destruction for destruction's sake has taken, has taken place on such a scale, in which the European spirit has been so utterly dark as it was dark in the war of 39 and 45. And it didn't come on us without warning, because ever since the Renaissance, the warnings have been multiplied, that there is a great shadow creeping up in the spirit of Western men. And that because it couldn't get a legitimate expression on our lives, even collect, even collect, it took this cataclysmic form to force itself upon our attention, to force for our attention, saying to us, there's something in us, there's something that we are neglecting, there's a great force, there are great energies within the human spirit, which we are not giving a legitimate share in our lives. And because we are not giving them a legitimate share in our lives, it's taking this murder and destructive form. Now, what makes it so difficult, particularly difficult, in dealing and in trying to realize what the shadow is, is because it's a shadow which is not, at the moment, confined purely to the Western spirit. I, for my sins, have to travel a great deal about the world. And I can promise you that there is not a culture, there is not a society in the world, from the primitive as I know it, even from the Stone Age, as I've given you this example, right up to the most sophisticated and complex technological society of our time, in which the shadow is not falling. I find it not only in Europe, I found it when I was in Russia. Nobody sitting here reading his papers can have any idea of the nihilism and the darkness which is building up in the soul of the ordinary Russian. Because only a small and an increasingly small part of his potential and his spiritual energy are expressed in this straight jacket society, <coughs> in this concept, mystical concept of a state which has been opposed to something. It's the same in China. It's the same in Japan. I have always, wherever I go in the world, I've made a point of going to the sacred places and the temples of all the people. And I travel them out. Because I feel you know, you do not know people unless you also know them through what through their sense of religion, through what they regard as their highest value in life. And it's not only here with us that our churches are running in. It's not only here with us that our churches seem to have lost contact with what we in the loneliness of the night when we are confined to our own rules for what we are seeking and what we know that we are denied. It's not only here. There is not a culture in the world today to which this does not apply. I, in India, 
the temples are no longer visible as they were before. The cry goes up everywhere. I was in India a few years ago, and it was the same cry from the holy men there as from the holy men among us here. I was in my favorite Zen Buddhist temple in Kyoto a few years ago talking to a young Zen Buddhist priest to whom I'd originally met with Dr. Suzuki, who was such a very remarkable and illuminated human spirit. And he said to me, yes, here are two our temples are in. Here are two who suffer from the same sickness of the spirit as you do in the West. And it's interesting to be used the word sickness of the spirit. Some years ago I went to see an old Zulu prophet in Zululand, whom I know extremely, whom I had known, he died a few years ago. And to me was one of the most truly, naturally religious people I'd ever known. Religious by instinct and religious by dedication to all the spirit of reverence in life. It came naturally to him. He was naturally a religious person without dogma or doctrine of any kind. And I went to see him and he was sitting there under the tree and was wearing this wonderful metal band around his head that holy that people among the Zulus who have acquired wisdom were. You can immediately see the symbolism which this expresses, the imagery from which this band around his head arises. It is the same image which produces the halo which is around the saint. It means that the spirit, it means to indicate that this spirit this person you confronted with, his home, is rounded. And I said to him, after we talked, I said, I want to talk to you very serious today about Ankulum Kulu, the first spirit of the Zulus. So the question I want to ask in this regard has been with me for many years. And he shook his head very sadly. And he said to me, why do you ask? I can good and good now. He said, nobody speaks of a good and good anymore. His praise names are forgotten. People only talk of things that are useful. There you have already deep here in the heart of Africa, this is a wedge of the slanted modern spirit dedicated only to the external, physical, materialistic manifestations of life and the denial of the great, invisible, impossible. Here you have the wedge experienced already in the heart of a natural and instinctively religious primitive society. It shows you how wide the shadow is. And even this, these Stone Age people, these Stone Age people had a story which expressed exactly how this uh, loss has come about. And I think I perhaps I'll tell you the story because again, it'll, when I, we, we come to see what it is that has gone dark and end, what it is the shadow which is cast all over the world, but the story might be helpful. And it was, uh, they, they, they explained this state by saying there was once a man who kept, kept a herd of very wonderful cattle. These cattle were entirely covered in black and white, black and white stipples. And it is very interesting that people like the Hottentots who tell this story, who were devoted to that castle, that this is a cattle who had black and white to regard it as sacred. You can immediately see why. Because they carried the uniform of those. There was both the white and the dark 
made into a living flesh and blood manifestation of the garden now. And they said because they were such precious cats, he looked out and beautiful. But one morning when he went to look, when he went to these cattle for his spiritual nourishment, he found that the cattle had no milk at all. And he thought, well, I've neglected them. I've been bred at fork down and see that they feed well today. And he took them, gave them, took them to a place where they had some wonderful pasture. And they fed well. He took them home in the evening and all their others were full. And he thought, in Africa you milk in the morning. So tomorrow I shall have a wonderful pasture. And in the morning, the others were slack and dry. He repeated. He, he tried to improve on what he'd done the, day, the previous day. He took to an even better part. He came back. The others were full. Yet the next morning, the others were slack and dry. The milk was gone. And he thought, well, there's something very mysterious happening. Something very, very mysterious happening. I must tonight take train to care and watch over the cat because there's something happening at night that is taking them both away. And he sat up hidden at night and at midnight, this mysterious midnight, which is the Chinese say is the hour when the noon is born, he saw a beautifully woven cord come down from the stars and down this cord came a lot of very beautiful young girls all carrying containers under their arms and give me a tiptoe into his claw, went among the cattle and started moving. And then this was too much for him, of course he jumped out and ran for them. They took an arm, scattered, and ran for this cord and went scrambling up the cord, very agile and adroit up to the stars. But he got there just in time to grab one by the ankle. And they say she was the most beautiful one of all. And pull her down. And she became <laughs> And she had, but she had with her this container. And she said to him, look, I'm very happy to stay with you, but I'm going to put this container in the corner of our house. And you must promise me that you will never look inside. And the man said, yes, he would never look in the party. But this went on for about six or seven months. And then one ended, and somehow this container was irritating more and more. Before then, you know, that this was really getting too much. And then he came back in the heat of the day from water, rather irritated. He saw this container, and it was too much for him. And he went and pulled off the lid and looked inside and burst out laughing and then put the lid back again. And in the evening, the woman came back from her work in the fields. And she had one look at the man, and she said, you took me, you took me my container. And he said, yes, I have. And he said, you're simply silly woman. Why did you make such a fuss about it? And she said, but why not? He said, well, God, there was nothing in it. And she said, nothing. He said, yes nothing. And at that, the story, as it was told to me, goes, she looked at him very sadly, turned her back on him, and walked straight into the red of a mythological African concept, and was not seen on earth as yet. And the woman who told me the story said to me, you know, it wasn't a fact that he looked into the past and wrote this poem. It really mattered. What really mattered was that having lift the lid of the container, he could not see inside all the wonderful star material he brought for them both to share from the stars. And this is our luck. This is our clue in the form of the story to what I would like to orchestrate for the world in more recognizable European terms. This is where we are today. We look in the container. 
and we see nothing inside. And this is our life. I <coughs> wish I could tell you a few more of these little <coughs> stories to carry the theme further, but I must, I must come back to our own time and place. I notice that my own time is running out. The tragic thing about this story, I mean, the fact that the man couldn't see what is in this particular basket, is that it's something which is not really confined to our past. And I think this is what we want to realize about uh, the problem of our shadow is that it seems to me not only confined to European history, but that it is extend to be extended and that this pattern is to be seen in the history of man at all times and at all places as we know. It seems to me that all cultures of which we have record and all the myths and legends to which we have access show that over and over again that in the history of man there has been a rejection, a failure to recognize the contribution of what the feminine can make to the life of man. It doesn't matter, there are moments, brief moments of exception in the history of the world where man is aware of the importance of feminine values and the masculine and the feminine, feminine aspects of the spirit are joined as they are joined in their physical union to procreate on life on earth. And then we get an immense flowering and an immense enrichment of the human spirit. We get this in the time of Athens at its highest. The thing to me which distinguishes Greece from Rome is precisely the fact that the Greeks had the, at their best, at their highest, and the sense of the importance of the feminine. They could look in a container and see the feminine. And this respect of the Greek for the feminine is so beautifully expressed in the, in the foundation story of the Greek spirit, the Odyssey, which is really a blueprint of what Greece was at its best, where they had, after a war, which was a war between two kinds of human beings about the role the feminine would play in their lives, the Greek, when this war was over, and apparently won in the here and the now, produced this marvelous allegory, which we call the Odyssey which is one of the most profoundly religious, the most profoundly religious accounts of the authentic pilgrimage of man, which has ever been written. And this is the man who has fought the war about the role that the feminine is going to play in the here and now, continues the journey to discover the feminine in another dimension himself. And this is this symbolized by the story of Odysseus or Ulysses, who ruled over an island kingdom called Ithaca, and who had on this island kingdom another form of feminine self, an eternal feminine self that was always weaving and spinning new patterns, provisional patterns of the feminine self of man to keep the collective world that was planning for our hands every morning to keep them at bay. 
and was faithful to this individual quest of this representative in search of his feminine self. In fact, that this is not only my own reading of the account of the story of Greece. It should be proved by the fact that Samuel Butler, who is probably not read much today, who wrote that very great book called The Way of All Flesh, who wrote the satire, Erewhon, which is a very remarkable satire, where there is a sense of psychological illumination, which is very, very unusual in that late Victorian day. But Samuel Butler was so convinced that he, he was so under the impression of this feminine element in the, in the Odyssey that um, he, wrote a, he wrote a book about it, trying to prove even that it wasn't written by Homer, but that the book was written by a woman. <laughs> and he traveled all over the Aegean, spent thousands of pounds retracing the steps of Odysseus to try and prove that it was written by a woman. Of course, uh, he didn't realize then, but I think it proved that it was written by the feminine in Homer. It was an expression of the supreme awareness of Athens, of Greece at its best, of the importance of the feminine. And this is what makes the Greek story so much more creative, so much more important to us, and which has enriched us so much more than the Roman one. Because the Roman spirit also starts with the journey. But how different is the journey? It starts with the journey of a man called Aeneas. And Aeneas also faced with the task of finding a new way of life after the destruction of Troy. Troy in flames, he has a choice. He has a choice of saving two people his own father Anchises or his own beautiful wife and he chooses to go into the flames and carry out his own father and he leaves his wife to perish and he does it and, and this was a trouble with Rome ever after forever after Rome carries an old father on his back and he carries an old father on his back to this day in spite of the other collected, perfunctory um, words of recognition which he pays to certain aspects of the feminine in man. But this realm which produced the concept of a state wedded to law and order and is where, as I said the other night, I'm certain that if there had been trains, there would have always been in time. This realm was a masculine authoritarian concept of life. And it's this concept of life which has dominated our own history. I can't go into the detail of it all, but you must, I hope, to believe me. And you turn to your own histories for confirmation, and you will see that as far as Western man is concerned, on the whole, except for brief privileged periods, the Renaissance was such a period. Why would the, Greek, the European spirit flower as it did in the Renaissance? Was because the, this ancient Greek whole in its awareness of masculine and feminine was brought back into contact with the Roman spirit when Constantinople fell and all the scholars and their books came to Rome for safety and brought back the story of Greece the story of Greece was joined <coughs> to the story of Rome, which has great, great virtues of its own. I don't want to invalidate. And these two met, and we have this immense flower of the European spirit called the Renaissance. But alas, it didn't last. The sense of how it wouldn't last is prophetically so in one of the most beautiful of Leonardo da Vinci's paintings where he painted the painting of the Virgin on the rocks. And clearly he had in his mind that already the world was preparing to betray the feminine as Ariadne had betrayed on the rocks of the Aegean after she brought the rescue the youth of Athens 
from being the rock in a labyrinth in Crete. She was abandoned on the Aegean. But there, he paints the Virgin alone, dark in a pagan city, alone on the rock. But there is this difference that, unlike Ariadne, the Virgin is not alone completely because she has a child in her bed. In other words, she has the promise of in infinite increase for the European in her bed. And I remember when I talked to Dr. Jung just before he died, the last time he died, we talked about this particular thing. And he said, yes, it's for me one of the greatest things he's ever painted. Because he says the mother is not here, because she has the child in her neck. And her feminine said, no, that one day the child will go free. So, but for the moment, both mother and the, the, the possibility of increase is presented to us for the Renaissance, but we abandon it. And we abandon it in the West, and the Western values are imposed on the rest of the world, and they are made to abandon also the feminine. And we start on a completely lopsided male development again. Again, I don't want to invalidate what we've done since the Renaissance. We owe it a great deal. But it is a lopsided development. We start on a rational, authoritarian male development almost entirely dedicated to observation of the external and physical and so so-called objective world. And in this we are guilty, we resume what has been the heresy of life from the beginning. It's a heresy which I say very seriously, it runs right through the Bible, which joins our own the Greek Roman story. It's another heresy where, where, where we are faced with a masculine authoritarian God, and where the feminine is almost always in existence, and where even in the New Testament, even after Christ who, rep, who was an embodiment of the feminine in man. A person like, a great, great person like St. Paul could organize his Christianity in such a way that the feminine was almost totally excluded from it. And Christianity itself, organized Christianity itself, has denied us, has denied the feminine a proper role in its life and has denied us the feminine that we need for an increase and renewal of our life. And this ancient heresy after the Renaissance is being repeated in a much more highly orchestrated, <coughs> illustrated, a much more highly intelligent form and with much more to be said for it. And that it creates this great confusion in the mind of modern man, that what we ex the only objective experience we can have <coughs> is in the world without. It doesn't, it fails to realize that inside ourselves we have an object, great objective world, as great an objective world within ourselves as it is in the world without. In fact, that subjective and within are not at all synonymous as people think they are. Within, there is objectivity as great as without. And we, yes, it's true, we are subject, we are subjective. We are subjective. We join world without and world within to make, as it were, a world without end. It doesn't even take a psychologist to tell us that. The poet Gerald Manley Hopkins knew about this when he wrote and said there are not only landscapes, there are also instincts as well. And he wrote that wonderful sonnet of his, Oh, the mind, the mind has mountains, 
consist of four frightful share no man has. And he's referring to this great objective world within ourselves. Now, this great objective world within ourselves is a world that can only be explored. Is a world that can only be explored by man with the aid and the help of his feminine self. With the aid, as already the myths and the legends, like those of Ariadne, which I told you about, like the Stone Age legends I told you about, man can only explore with the aid of his feminine self. And in all cultures and all time, this, this has been suppressed. It's been a entirely a male dominated system. And now, for the, uh, and as a result of this, because we have lost the intermediary, the feminine intermediary, between the external world and this dark, unexplored world within us, the world which the poet Dante explored in a poetic way when he followed his feminine vision in Beatrice, right down into the streets of the city of this before he could ascend up to heaven. This dark, dark world has forces within it that have grown angry and great for God's land and place. And this is the shadow. And it's not only our own shadow, <coughs> as I say, it expresses itself as the personal shadow. We have our personal shadows of what we reject and what we deny in our souls. One of the great penalties, if you like, of consciousness. This mysterious, this mysterious element in life, which imposes this great responsibility of consciousness upon us. One of these most distinctive elements is that it's based on choice. It forces us at every stage of the way to choose. And in choosing, we also reject. And unless consciousness, at some stage in its life, says, I've taken what I've chosen as far as it will go, and I must now go back and look at again what I have rejected and bring it back into partnership with what I originally chose. Unless this is done, consciousness never. <coughs> It becomes more fanatical. And if all these other contents who've been waiting for that turn in our lives begin to despair, they are possessed and personalizing something now for you purely by way of communication, starts growing like a one-eyed titan <coughs> that would wreck ourselves in journey of this everything which Ithaca and Penelope <coughs> represent in the tale of the Odyssey. And it are these loving, caring, feeling values which have been eliminated from life. These are the things that are in the shadow. So much in the shadow that you, you cannot, uh, you can hardly use a word which used to have great meaning at one time. A common word like love anymore has always become a dirty word. People almost laugh. We are living in a society where each human being not only cannot experience love themselves, but they cannot recognize it when it's offered to them. They see only round the button the hatred the frustration which comes from this area of shadow that compels them of the field within, they can no longer recognize it. And the only way back, the only way back to come to terms to deal with the shadow is first of all to recognize and work in its manifestation in ourselves. Because we cannot even perceive its workings in society unless we recognize it in ourselves. 
And when we see it in it's working in our society, then we can begin to be aware of this immense light which is created in history that lies behind us. Until it seems to be a shadow of almost cosmic proportion. Until it, it seems to us as it seems to go to, to, to you as a shadow cast by the God himself. And that we are individually and collectively like Job and his ashes. And we have to endure the shadow of God. But thanks to people like you. Thanks to people like you. And above all, thanks to you. We are aware today of the area. We are aware today of the area from which these sinister forces have come in the past, from where they build up. We are aware that there are immense energies in the human service to which we can have access. We are aware that we have a feminine psyche that we can act as an intermediary between us and what is unknown and bring it out to play a valid role in the life of our time. And this to me is one of Jung's greatest concepts that create all life on earth. Always the race is the feminine, and even in this dream it tells you, in this dark, dark, uh, hidden earth, this is the element, the rejected feminine. This is the thing which is missing from history. This is the thing which is brought up, up, out, brought into being this cataclysmic mechanism in the spirit of all civilization where human beings are perpetually swimming over from one opposite into another and merely becoming what they've been before in reverse in another dimension creating another slant of partial tyranny in its place a mechanism so old that the Greek poet and philosopher Heraclitus already observed it and had a word for it, which he called Inancio Drogio, at sea. And, 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 and this is where all the disasters have come from in history, because what we sacrifice consciously in order to make valid of what we are consciously aware comes back one day, knife in hand, demanding to sacrifice the thing that sacrifice is. And the only way out is for this feminine element, this love, to make us aware that this dark, projected aspect of ourselves, that this can be the source of our own peace. It need not be us. It need not be the enemy that we make up. If we turn to it, humility, if we go down to it with this golden thread, of the feminine restored, we can bring it out into the light of the day for our own increase, and it can lead to our relationship with God. And if you're going, oh gosh, the time runs out, you see, I can only just throw a few ideas at you. I don't want to say if you go, you look at your three memories and reflections, you will find, you will find that in the chapter, My Psychiatric Years, he mentions about eight or nine cases that influenced him <coughs> very profoundly and changed the whole course of his life. And one, with one exception, they're all women. There's one man, and this man is merely mentioned as a woman because he chose how behind this facade of extreme normality which this man represents. There is, or there are, already met the most destructive psychotic elements. And he turns away from this man instantly because he knows that if he does anything with him, he could have released forces that neither he nor the man can cope with. But he turns to, to the rejected woman 
I could give you many examples that already as a boy the spirits of his interest in him were the voices of women and the intuitions of women to which the scientists and the world would listen. When he wrote the first book which caused his breakthrough Freud, the book which is originally called Psychology of the Unconscious, and now I think it's called Symbols of Transformation. When he wrote this book, what was he doing? He was following as his guide an American spinster lady who was to go insane. It was his shattering genius and originality that he saw that the whole problem of the modern world and of modern man and of his own and of his re the rediscovery for his capacity for religious experience was in following this denied, this rejected, this averted, this ugly feminine face, if you like. So ugly that when he took Freud to see one of the patients in the book Holtz with whom he'd worked for nine years, and an old lady who taught him a great deal, although he couldn't cure her, and to whom he owed a great deal, Freud afterwards said to him, I dare you, yes, she was quite interesting, but I simply cannot conceive how you could have spent all that time with such an ugly and disagreeable old woman. And he was shaken to the core, because he never thought of her either as ugly and disagreeable. And this was his genius, that he could see, that he could recognize Cinderella before the ball. It's easy enough to recognize Cinderella at the ball, but to recognize what she is in the kitchen, where she is stained with the ashes of the burnt out fire of her own day. If you could spot it there and make that in sky. It's easy enough for Dante to follow the face of Beatrice that is beautiful and go on this journey. Or Ariadne because she was beautiful. But to take this ugly averted, rejected feminine face and make that disguise, I find that one of the most moving, one of the most inspiring things in the world of God. Because this is even what is commanded in the New Testament, and it says that the stone which the nations reject the game of cornerstone of the business to come. And this shadow, which is falling over now, this shadow of the feet, of the feeding, the caring values in life, with all the non-rational, the intuitive things to be raised and honored and put alongside all that we have rationally in our male fashion discovered and to which we owe a lot. This can only be done by only the feminine. And I can't go on. I would like to go on and, and, and define for you what this feminine is. And that for the first time in history, we now have a concept of the human spirit in which both the masculine and the feminine are clearly empirically charged. <coughs> they are there as signposts which we can follow. That man and woman are no longer a twosome, but that they are a foursome. But the man has a feminine element, and the woman has a masculine element. And the these four, we can take on the burden of life and creation and time as a foursome, where we feel twosome and part. And this is empirically true and empirically established. And this is there for his own father. But if we are going to escape, if we are going to rescue our time from the shadow which is feminine, we can do so only by renewing our own relationship as the Stone Age man did. Renewing our relationship with God. Renewing it because believing, I think again, as humans in Trinity established, that by renewing our relationship with God, we not only renew ourselves, but we, in a sense, renew God. It's two-way traffic. God and man, which you experience, the God which you experience as a mighty activity, 
in his spirit at the age of four and continued to experience all his life. He was serving it is all his life. And this God is in partnership with man. This is what makes it so individual, uh, so meaningful. The individual human being can take upon himself, as it were, part of the dark, transforming, as it were, the cosmic shadow, the shadow of the universe, and make it new into new material for life and meaning on Earth. I have said one tenth of what I wanted to say, but there's the long time to do it. Most of the tenth that he has said, and um, I'm sure that we shall draw out some of the other nine tenths in the course of the day. We have what, 20 minutes, just over 20 minutes? Yes, quarter of an hour. I've got that down, down there, there about quarter to one in my paper. So we will perhaps go on from 20 to one. Um, if the floor is now yours to ask questions, raise points. I'd like to ask uh, and, and to say a little more about what actually the shadow is and to illustrate it by reference to a particular country that you mentioned, uh, namely Russia. What is it that is going on? Uh, and you had the question, uh, <coughs> thank you, Well, um, the, 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 I personally, of course, have never been able to give myself um, a rational definition of the shadow that I find perfectly satisfactory. I find it's, a, it's such a transcendental thing that in non-transcendental terms, in this sort of uh, trying to express it purely in words, um, <coughs> it's almost impossible. And that I find that I, 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 I can understand, I come near to what I think is the meaning of the shadow by presenting it to you as the shadow as a symbolic image. And it's all that, I think, that constantly in mind. We are uh, forced to by the nature of consciousness to put on one side and uh, turn our back. And uh, the shadow in itself is neither, is not good or bad. What we reject in itself is not good or bad. In fact, what I've been mean, hinting at you today is that the shadow is the material. It's what the alchemist would have called the base nap out of which man can renew himself, can increase himself. This is where he turns to when he has used all that he has collected, when he's taken in his part. This is where he turns for new energies, for new material to make a greater self. A, 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 a greater and more tolerant expression of life on Earth. But uh, it's, um, uh, in fact, the, the, the criminal people of Africa have a very great respect for the shadow. If um, a Zulu, for instance, wants to pay you a very great compliment, he will say to you, ah, you throw the shadow. It shows that you're here, that you're a person of something. They get terrified, they have said to me, what happened to you the other day? Why do you throw a shadow anymore? Where is your shadow? Where did you put it? But I wish I knew where you put it myself. <laughs> because this is the problem. We can recognize our shadow, that's the first thing. But uh, in psychological terms, I could give you, which I don't want to use today, I could turn um, and one starts into uh, concepts of psychological type and the four functions in the human being. I, I could sort of go into a very good technical examination of what psychologically the shadow means, but I'd like to leave it to you symbolically as all of that, that we have to get this reality at one point in the achievement of a certain limited objective in life, but to which we have to return sooner or later to bring out, um, to, to, to give it role in our lives as well. Because this is uh, why it happens, I can't say, but it is a fact. It does happen. History proves over and over again that if you neglect what you have suggested, it comes back as a dark and angry force and destroys you. 
You've only got to look at the paintings of Broca to see how injustice and art it was aware of the shadow which the age of reason threw over the whole of Europe and which led to that monstrous phenomenon, the French Revolution. And when the heads of over by thousands in the middle of all over the world, you air for the skills and you are substituted to the heads of the in a thousand times. The death of the government was not which it came out of what was a phenomenon of pure reason. When reason was being crowned in Notre Dame in Paris, the God, the heads were being cut off by the thousands in Paris. Of course, <coughs> it was the reason instinctively the masses knew the reason was the ascending <coughs> member and had to be destroyed. But it is one side of it, it's one side of this man which produces an angry shadow. And the Greeks knew it. The Greeks knew it in, it, uh, in their sense of proportion, in their sense of a many-sided individual, in many, many expressions how important it was that man should be a many-sided, highly differentiated. Well, now, the shadow of Russia, to come particular to the shadow of Russia. Well, the shadow of Russia is, that's, uh, uh, is the shadow of the sophisticated, primitive, collective man. It is the shadow cast by a culture and a society which sets the collective value above that of the individual. And to me, the whole meaning of this thing, as you read it, is that the human spirit, and particularly the Western spirit, this is our great contribution to life, have tried to create a claim of individual who will take upon himself the almost impossible task of making the collective specific, of making the universal, the cosmic value specific, who as it were will take upon himself the task of creation in his own individual life. And that he will, on behalf of life, on behalf of the collective, on the behalf of the universe, he will go a lonely individual road and he will, no matter what pressures are exerted against him, he will stand fast in the interest of the universe and die in his own intellect, in his own individual integrity. But an integrity which is not a rational integrity, but it's something more. And an integrity where he is, where the I in himself to simplify is joined to the God which he experienced in himself. Now the whole of life, the whole of history seems to me, has been labored to create this kind of a society, a society which will consist of individuals of this kind, joined to the famous, the specific, and the small, and the individual in life. This is the whole meaning. This is the striving, the deepest striving of history. This is the message for us as Christians, incidentally, of Christ. That we should live our own individual lives as faithfully and truly as he lived the life to which he has felt himself to be called. Now, in Russian society, there's no disregard in Russian society as the greatest heaven of which one is capable. And because this particular concept which I put to you is a natural corollary, uh, a, a natural parallel, as a natural, another pearl, as a cosmic pearl in the concept of a God, which is in partnership with the eye. Because no individual, no matter how strong, how intelligent, how gifted, can, on a purely egotistical plane, maintain this kind of an art, this kind of an individual. He can only do so when he's constantly reinforced and he feels himself in partnership with what I have just called the love. 
something greater to himself. Well, this mechanism is there. And it's very interesting to me that today, for instance, um, that I've always felt that between the geographical distance which man put between himself and his sense of God and the God, there is something very meaningful. Uh, Greece was at its most creative when the gods were near, when they were just on Mount Olympus, and they appeared walking in their midst. And they had no churches here because every Greek was his own priest. And he had his own sense of God. And they were very close, they were just on the Olympus. And the thing started going wrong and God started moving out into the sky. And the further they went, the more unreal the relationship became and the less ineffectual. And the same thing happened in Christianity, the more, the further away we put good God out into the blue, the more unreal and meaningless our relationship became. But now we know where we're experiencing. And Philip we know that we're experiencing in something which you would call the collective unconscious. And somewhere between the conscious, the mystery of the conscious, which represents, I think, the deepest longing of the unconscious. It's the most mysterious part of the conscious, of, of, of the whole the totality of the human spirit. It's this deep, deep longing of the unconscious to become conscious. And that this, um, now that we can know that this pattern that we call God is empirically established within ourselves, we are in a greater position than ever to achieve this kind of an individual Now this kind of individual is completely, totally rejected, and at the same time, God is totally rejected. You cannot be, you cannot be a member of the Communist Party in Russia unless you are an atheist. You cannot have any office under the state unless you are a practicing atheist. And that the attacks on God are continual because the attack on God is the same as the attack on the individual who, in a small way, tries to reflect what God is and what God is longing for. And this is the terrible challenge that's building up in Russia. Russia is full of people who are either the hooliganism in Russia is a very formidable phenomenon and it's the greatest sort of, uh, 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 sort of crime of which a young man can be accused in Russia. It's very severe the punishment, the sort of uh, vandalism that we see in Russia. <coughs> if you have no idea of the extent to which it's run in Russia, uh, and I, I saw some very alarming illustrations of it myself. And there is a, 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 a grave building up in this place, because what's the Russian done? This hunger in man for this individual relation, which can only be ultimately satisfied by a capacity for experiencing this I, love, this relationship with God. This the hunger, um, if it cannot be expressed legitimately, goes over all these great energies. And these are the greatest energies of which the human being is capable. One of the last letters that you ever wrote he said to me, I cannot define for you what God is. But what I can say to you is that my whole life and my work has proved empirically that the pattern of God exists in every human being. And that this pattern has its at its disposal the greatest transforming energy of which the human being is capable. Now, these greatest transforming energies, if they cannot be put to a legitimate use, they find substitute uses, what the Germans call ersatz use, and they find their use, they are going into the concept of the state. Now, when you hear the Russians speak about the state, it's quite alarming. When I was a boy in the Far East, I mentioned, met a great many white Russians. And I went to a white Russian service. And the first time I was in Russia and I heard 
a young Russian called Alyosha, to whom I was devoted, when I heard him speak about the state battle. You're using that word. What is this game for? What does it remind me of? And then suddenly I had it. It's exactly the term of voice with which the white Russians, after the revolution in China, and then two other Americans, so they put the exact term of voice in the series to have got. It's not state as we use it. It's not, uh, you know, they can't even laugh about it. I mean, this is, this is taking the place of God. And you've got this terrible collective concept of love, where any form of individual expression is um, regarded as uh, deviationism, bourgeois decadence, and modern popular. And the reaction in it can take many forms. It takes forms of blind destruction, of blind, um, uh, blind acts of violence, and rebellion madness, sullen resignation, all the forms that we see in our midst, or when it has the voice of genius and a real subject to express it. It can take the voice of a pastor not for the love or the voice of Solzhenitsyn, who today is one of the few voices, unaided, out of his own nature and instinct, without the help of psychology, talks with the authentic voice of the West. Talks of these things we talked about. Talks, as he says, and I can recognize the area in which he's talking about, but he said, When you have lived for as long as I have on the frontier between life and death, not knowing from day to day which way you can go, you are only interested in one thing, and that is the truth. Only the truth can bring you meaning and comfort. Well, not quite as long as me, but I myself, in a half year, lived in this area myself. And I, can re- and I know enough about it to recognize the voice that he used is the authentic voice. And there, from the region, you can see where the shadow falls. I hope I've been long, and I'm just going to add a little bit. My followers take a lot of support. Has the West not rejected God just as much by indifference, apathy, and love of money? I don't. Yes, I think, of course, the, the, I think the West has rejected God. I wouldn't say that, not in the same way as the Russians. The okay. Russians have done so consciously and willfully because they have God as their enemy. Just as the French Revolution is to God as God is their enemy. And don't let us forget that in France, until the goal changed between the last war. The Roman Catholic orders weren't allowed in France. They'd been there ever since the French Revolution. You couldn't get promotion in the French army. Even in the, the outbreak of the last war, if you were, many French Catholic uh, officers were, were captured. Why Joffre was chosen to lead the French armies in the 1418 war, everybody knew, knew him to be a half incompetent. He was chosen because he was anti clerical. And it uh, and it was, uh, it was only, 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 uh, only later on that 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 that, that the um, as the war got more and more serious that they allowed the cap uh, the, the uh, people like Foch and Peter, mm-hmm. who was at his height then to come back because they were out and captured. So you had this uh, the, 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 this same act and people always uh, they want to if they hate <coughs> and they want to destroy. Of course, this is the, at the back. This is the negative, the, the, one of the manifestations, of, negative manifestations of the shadow is revolution and destruction. It wants to achieve violently by destruction because it couldn't achieve it legitimately and it doesn't think that in a legitimate way. And the first thing they do is always to attack man's concept of God. But we have gone through a different experience. I believe um, that God has, well, has gone by default with us. And it's gone very largely because the institution whom we set up to safeguard society against this kind of thing, like the churches, have failed us. The churches have not done their job in this regard. The churches have not tried to give us a truly contemporary expression of religion. 
it's nice and lovely to try and rest the back on the revelation as it's come down to us from the ages. But revelation is not revelation unless it moves on. And we cannot pin ourselves down to one revelation of God. And we have in our organized religion, even in the church which has preserved most of the feminine, like the Roman Catholic Church, where, thank God, a lot of the symbolic reality of Christianity is still observed. But even there, we've only served a partial and increasing the archaic concept of religion. And the churches, this is the great scandal of our time, is that the churches will not go down into this abyss in the soul of man and look at it again. The churches don't know what the soul of modern man is about because they still treat it in this archaic, medieval, or at the most early Reformation now. And I mean the reformers, what did the Reformation do if not absolutely bad of what was little that was there of the feminine in Great Christianity, Calvin and John Knox and company chased it out. Mm. And so um, we are suffering from quite, 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 uh, quite, quite, quite a different dilemma. But the churches are becoming aware of this. And I think it's one of the things that Jung talked to me about, one of the things that hurt him most, and if you read his letters, this agonizing crowd, he can't understand. Why do the churches not join me with him in what he's trying to do? He says, for instance, he said, I, uh, he, he said, I wrote to Archbishop Temple, and I, there was a charismatic Archbishop in the century, the temple, temple. He wrote to William Temple and said, send me, please, one priest to work with me. So that we can see what sort of dilemma the modern soul faces. And we can, you, you will then know how to deal with the modern soul of man, because we have not got the church's lack modern evidence, modern curiosity into what the predicament, the spiritual predicament of modern man is like. It's no good exhorting ourselves in the terms of what the church offers and people said. I mean, there's an enormous amount of value. Jung himself tried to bring the dogma and doctrine into its proper symbolic pers perspective over and over again. We have immense respect for it. The dogma cannot satisfy us. What we want is to be able to experience God again. We want to rediscover God and not get our appetites for God back. We want to get to come back to this area of the great hunger, as I call it, because this is the greatest hunger of all in the human spirit, and it's getting no food in the modern sense of the word. It's no good exhorting us anymore. We are, we are children of, 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 a, of a scientific rationalist age. We need a different language because science is valid. We don't want to destroy that, but we can have a voice too which can measure up to that because science without religion has no meaning, but religion without science has no meaning because it's this. We must, and uh, we must be able to draw that experience again. But our dilemma is different. It's not because we like the Russians, because we will be exclude God. It's because we can't find him. As if all our churches, uh, uh, at the moment, I'm using the symbolic, they have been shattered, this is where it's as the cathedral and Baal and Jung's great vision, where it was shattered by a piece of divine excrement. Why a divine excrement? Because the excrement is a symbol of food uh, which has been used up. All the nourishment has been ex extracted, and there is just the waste matter to be expelled. In that form, and in that shape, the great, great services Judge rendered us have been exhausted. There's a new service to be performed. We do not want to abolish, and people like myself, all of us, care passionately about the church, but we want them to renew themselves. And they must get on with their original task, which is the task of making them whole. Whole, healing, holiness all have the same root. They're the same thing. And this must be done in a contemporary, a 20th century way. And it must take into account all these new empiric factors about the psychological pattern and psychological needs of modern man. Only religion can rescue us from our 
Dat komt vooral uit het kwestie dilemma. Dat is not a religion that we can consciously think of, because it's a painful to go in and re-experience it again. And this is, I hope, the answer that we have not worked with. I don't think, and that there are scientists and people who are quite silly, yes, we know these, these people. But if you talk to a modern physicist, you will be amazed how close the physicist and the psychologist stand at this moment in time. Because the physicist, when he goes into this nature of the state and finds the tensions that are in here, that this is not inanimate, he thinks it is. And that in this, there are whole solar systems. And that it vanishes, this table itself contains an infinite mystery inside itself. You find the physicists and psychologists are, are, are very, very near. It just, it, uh, this is what makes, I think, it's so disastrous because it is no longer as if we did not know where the cure is. It's no longer as if we did not know the answer. We do know. And we can be forgiven if we do something actually. But not do what we should do when we know what to do. Better than we do. Is this now?